Thank you, Roy. Well, today I want to talk about something that is actually one of my favorite topics. It's an incredibly important subject for the future of every church, and I think it's particularly important for the future, uh, frankly, of Bethany Chapel. I'm weaving a few concepts together, and I want to be very clear and hope you can follow me, but I was a little bit challenged as I was putting this together because a lot of this has to do with how we view the world around us. In the year 2000, if you wanted a movie, you had a few choices. If you want to watch a movie, just 19 years ago, you had really just about three choices. You could have a very good television package and hope that the movie you like is on their schedule. And so uh, unlike, you know, many people with peasant cable, like uh, Steve Marston, for instance, I stayed at his house and I went through a drought of television that almost killed me. But... <clears throat> If you want to be able to watch a movie, you need to, you know, order a package, a satellite or a cable package that would likely at some point actually show a movie, uh, for instance, but get a good one. The, the other option is to actually go to the theater, but, you know, you're not going to go to the movie theater, you know, many times a week. That gets a little spendy, and who has time for that? It's a little inconvenient. And you want to wait till they get a little cheaper in the video store. And that's what you would do. In the year 2000, you would go to a video store and you would create a subscription to rent videos. And uh, I did that. The go-to option in the States was Blockbuster Video. I'm assuming they had Blockbusters up here as well. Blockbuster had over 9,000 stores. Over 9,000 stores. And they were just one of many uh, chains. I actually typically went to Hollywood Video. And soon, it wasn't just the video stores that were doing this. It was gas stations and grocery stores. Remember, they all had rental sections in them. Everybody was in on this, and everybody was making a killing on this because they charged you to take the movie. They charged you late fees. It was ridiculous, but everyone made a killing on all of us poor suckers in this video enterprise. It was a big, I was a big part of this sort of commercial arena as well because I'm a movie guy. I like something always in the background. If I'm looking at my computer, I still like something in the background. So I always like to have movies or sports or something going on, and I was a big part of this. And for a while, when we moved into our home on White Birch Court, which we're trying to sell right now, please pray, but for a while, <coughs> we didn't have a satellite or cable. And so I would go to Hollywood Video, and I had a subscription uh, I wanted to say a prescription, maybe that's what it was too. A subscription for maybe $12.99, $14.99 a month, and I could get unlimited videos. And I'm telling you, those places were busy. There were lines in those video stores. There were multiple people checking out people, you know, getting videos. And I would go to the action and adventure section. That's sort of my area, you know, action and adventure. And maybe potentially a drama, you know, I'm sure I got the notebook, okay. And, <clears throat> and I cried, all right. So for those of you who are worried about I cried at the notebook. But you also need to know I cried during Rambo as well. So any touching movie like that pulls on my heartstrings. So anyway, <clears throat> in the year 2000, during the height of this, a man named John uh, Antiago, I believe that's how you pronounce it, not sure, Antiago met with a man named Reed Hastings. Antiago was the CEO of Blockbuster Video. Hastings was the CEO of a little startup company called Netflix. Netflix was just ramping up. Only a couple of years old, I believe it started in 1997, and it was a mail service company. They would mail you a video with no late fees, which was nice. You didn't have to really, you know, get out of your house to go to the video store. You could see all this online, and they were very economical. Their subscriptions, I think, were down, you know, in the single digits uh, per month, and you could get a couple of videos at a time. And all of this was before streaming video. So you had to actually get a physical video to watch a movie. When Reed Hastings uh, met with John Antiaco, he was basically laughed out of the office. No, we're not interested in a partnership. Today, Netflix as a company is worth about $119 billion. Blockbuster is bankrupt. And all of the video stores, I believe, a couple have lasted till a couple of years ago, probably even after bankruptcy or in bankruptcy, that were in very remote areas that wouldn't have good internet for streaming services. Today, Blockbuster is bankrupt, uh, and Netflix streams content to 151 million subscribers. 
Change is painful and disruptive. Change is good sometimes. Change is not good sometimes. Some changes improve. Some changes destroy. Historically, the church struggles with change, big time. We are the most out-of-date organization, institution on the planet because of this issue. Why do we struggle with change? Because we deal with absolutes that don't change. We have a God's word and it doesn't change. We have a God who doesn't change. And so we struggle with change because often change in the church tends to come from change in the world around us. And so we're legitimately skeptical of change because we're thinking, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, God doesn't change, his word doesn't change. Is this change coming into the church a violation of God's word? And that's a very good question to ask because we want to make sure we stay consistent with God's word. But change shouldn't always be a problem for us. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. Now we've been warned in the Bible about the world around us, which is why the church struggles to change. We've been warned because many Bible texts actually deal with this. And these are the kinds we're familiar with. Romans 12, 2. Be not conformed to this world, this cosmos. So when things come from the world into the church, we're naturally skeptical. We're not to be conformed to the world. We're not to be pressed into its mold is what that Greek word means. 1 John 2, 15. Love not the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. John 5, 19, I believe Jesus said this, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So when we're in the church and change comes from the world, we're naturally skeptical as to whether or not we should adapt to it because we've been warned about the world around us and we see it and we try to protect our kids and our grandkids from it. You see, cosmos, the Greek word, often means, and this is sort of my rendition or a compilation of other definitions, it is the whole mass of humanity Hostile to God and organized against the cause of Christ. That's what the world means in the Bible, generally. It's the whole mass of humanity hostile to God and organized against the cause of Christ. Now, it's not hard to see that. Let me give you a few examples. It's the world that gave us materialism. The idea that value equals net worth. That your human value is based on what your salary is. That comes from the world. That doesn't come from Jesus. It's the world that gave us every alternative explanation other than God to all that we see and experience. It's the world that gives us an explanation in biology that takes God out of the equation, and that's evolution. It's the world that gave us, uh, you know, astronomy, uh, the Big Bang, an alternate explanation to creation. Now, maybe God used the Big Bang, maybe he didn't. I believe the Big Bang in scientific circles is actually going out of style, believe it or not. But it's the world that gives us these alternate explanations. It's the world that gives us alternate explanations of how to explain geology instead of the Genesis flood and those types of things. Well, everything's just billions and millions and millions of years old to explain away God's supernatural power. The world gives us that. And even in the church, we don't agree on all of those things. I get that. It's the world that gives us deconstructionism. This is the most dangerous one as it relates to literature and the Bible. The world gives us deconstructionism, a belief that all literature, including scripture, needs to be interpreted through the lens of the hearer, not the writer. So in that, we lose original intent, we lose the emphasis of God behind his word because we just think, well, the Bible's sort of a living document. It applies to our generation like we would read it if we got it today with our current morals and perspectives. It takes away the impact of what God has said. It's the world, this is maybe the most dangerous one in Canada and the U.S., if you're in college, this is deadly. It's the world that gave us philosophical pluralism, a view that all religions and philosophical systems are equal, and the one sin on a university campus that you cannot commit is to say that you have the truth. Because there is no truth. What's true for you may not be true for me, which may not be true for somebody else. It's the world that caused my daughter, as a freshman in college, to sit in a class where her university professor said, if you don't believe in evolution, get the F out of college. Not out of his class. Get out of college. That's the world. Sorry, you probably never had a pastor say that before. I apologize. <laughs> You'll get over it. Anyway. 
But not everything around us is evil. Sometimes the world is our foe. It's our enemy. But sometimes the world is sort of morally neutral. For instance, your car. I mean, it's not morally neutral anymore, but it used to be morally neutral. Now there's questions about that. You know, your cell phone, that's morally neutral. Your dog is morally neutral. Your cat, not so much so. Your dog is morally neutral. You know, Doritos are morally neutral. I mean, except for red dye number, I don't know what it is. Anyway, they're morally neutral. But here's the problem. The church's view of the world has everything to do with its evangelistic effectiveness. How you view the world, whether you view it as a friend, an enemy, or whether it's neutral at times, has everything to do with how we present ourselves to the world in order to share Jesus. Let me give you an example. If the, church is our, if the world is our friend, then here's what happens. If the world is always the friend and the church won't stand against it, then you end up with the church adapting to the culture and compromising. And then the church loses its sanctifying effect in the world. If whatever the world says is okay in the church, then eventually we don't believe in sin anymore and we're not going to reach anyone with the gospel because we're immersed in the culture and we're no different. And that is happening all over Protestant Christianity in Western society where they will not stand against anything and don't believe sin exists anymore. Everything is explained away on marriage and human sexuality and right and wrong in every area. That's the world in the church. And we can't be there. But if the world is the enemy all of the time, here's where we end up. Then the church withdraws. You know what that looks like? The holy huddle. If the world is always the enemy, we're so afraid of the world, we create our own subcultures. We become the holy huddle. We're sort of like the Amish. And we like to look at the Amish this way, but the reality is we're this way as evangelicals many times. And we create these separatist movements is what they're called. The Pharisees actually were a separatist movement. Now I know we want to pick on the Pharisees. If you know the origins of the Pharisees, they were very well intentioned. We do that as Christians many times. There are all kinds of separatist movements, some of which I've been a part of, some of which you're a part of. They're not all bad. Christian schools are a separatist movement. The fact that you have this sort of interesting relationship with the Catholic church and Catholic schools as part of the public system or however is very interesting. But schools, private schools, Catholic schools, Christian schools, that's a separatist movement. Homeschooling is a separatist movement. I went to a Christian school much of my life. So I've been a part of that, and part of that is legitimate, where we're trying to protect our children for some period of time before we release them into the world, which is hostile to their faith. So is the world a friend? That's a problem. We compromise. Is it our enemy? We can sometimes withdraw too much where we don't touch the world and don't influence them. Or is it neutral at times where we look for common ground in the culture when and where possible without compromising so we can reach people. That's what I would suggest we need to do. But no matter how we view the world, Jesus died for the same people who are entrapped in its philosophical grip. So how should we approach the people around us who are a part of this world system which is organized philosophically against God? How do we recognize that we're never going to agree with the world philosophically we don't want to completely withdraw from it where we're not relevant to it. How do we deal with people? How do we deal with that as a church? And how do we do that individually? There is a passage of scripture which just jumps out of the New Testament on this topic. It's probably the most important passage of scripture for any church as it relates to how you position yourself in the culture. It's on page 134 in your New Testament. So last quarter of the Bible, uh, the Pages start over in the New Testament, so get about five-sixths of the way through. Find page 134. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 19. You've probably heard this passage before. It's incredibly important to this topic. And I would say, I don't think there's a more important message for the future of Bethany Chapel than this passage of Scripture. And I don't say those kinds of things very often. 1 Corinthians 9, 19. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all so that I may win more. To the Jews I became as a Jew so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. 
to those who are without law, Gentiles, as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that I may by all means save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel, so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. This is Paul's evangelistic philosophy about dealing with all kinds of people in the world around him. First, Paul says, our mission, his mission, to serve the spiritual interests of every person. Now, I would actually say you could throw in there of every lost person. Although one of these examples, they may not have been lost as he talks about reaching out to the weak, which may already have been Christians. But in general, he's saying our mission is to serve the spiritual interests of every lost person. Though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all so that I might win more or win some. Now, Paul uses some interesting terminology here, and I want to give you a little background. Paul is an apostle. Most apostles were paid in the early church. They received some sort of income from the churches they ministered in. They traveled with their wives, which is the point Paul is making in 1 Corinthians 9. What he's saying is, I'm not a regular apostle. I have apostolic authority, I have apostolic credentials, but I don't act like every other apostle. He says most of the, the apostles uh, are traveling with their believing wives. He says that in verse 5. Most spiritual leaders in that era were moving toward paid status. The elders, especially in the church who had the gift of teaching, you'll find that in the epistles, the elders who had the gift of teaching were worthy of double honor. Those started being paid. So in the first century, you've got this movement toward a paid clergy from a volunteer clergy. Now, I know that creates some interference with your brethren roots. I get that. I, I understand the background of brethrenism was an anti-clergy movement in many ways. But even in the first century, elders and apostles, particularly those who were gifted in teaching, were starting to get paid. And Paul is making that point because he's not paid. He's making that point because he's saying, I don't ask you for that. I'm supporting myself. And his point is this. Since I'm supporting myself, nobody owns me. Nobody's paying me. Therefore, nobody owns me. That's his point. Nobody owns me. Then he says, nobody owns me, but I voluntarily enslave myself to every lost person. No supporters own me. I'm not getting money from anyone. But I make myself a slave to everybody who doesn't know Christ. It's an interesting statement. Now he uses the language of the culture. Slavery was incredibly common. Uh, some would say, I believe I've read the statistic that maybe two-thirds of the people in Rome or some cities in Rome were, were actually not free individuals during the first century. You know, like more slaves than free persons. Now, you had all kinds of slavery back then, and I want to explain what might be going on here. Slavery uh, is, is probably never a good thing, except for the third form I'm going to talk about, which you, is not what you think of as slavery. There are very oppressive forms in the first century when Rome would conquer a new territory. So slavery, <laughs> sorry. So slavery could result from wars or famines. And you would have all kinds of people, perhaps hundreds of thousands, millions, taken into slavery at once in a great war. Uh, you have softer forms. When slaves rose in stature in Roman households, even though they were still property in that culture, some became very, very close to the family members and actually occupied high positions, even in government, yet they weren't free individuals. It's a very interesting concept in ancient Rome. Now, granted, they didn't have rights, and that's why it was still slavery. There is a form of slavery that was very soft. It was voluntary. You'll find in ancient Israel, particularly if you read Exodus 21, where there's a form of slavery that existed that God was okay with in this case, where you were under such economic hardship that you would go to a wealthier landowner and say, hey, in order to pay off my debts, I want to serve you. And that person had to let you go after seven years. In the seventh year, you were automatically free under the law. It wasn't permanent. However, in some situations where you were economically at risk, people decided, you know what, I'm actually better off working for this wealthy landowner than I am on my own. I'm concerned for my wife and children. I will voluntarily become a permanent 
servant or slave in this person's household. And in Exodus 21, 6, it talks about that. They would take that individual with the, the judges or city elders, the judges in the city. They'd go to, I'm guessing, the city gates. And there they would take an awl and they would pierce the individual's ear. And he would become a permanent member of that wealthier person's household as a servant, as a slave. And they would be taken care of until they died. It was voluntary slavery. It was like a long-term labor contract. It's in the book of Exodus. This is probably what Paul is talking about. Nobody owns me, but rather I sell myself to the obligation to reach every person with the gospel. I'm not beholden to anybody. Nobody's paying my salary, so they can't tell me what to do. But instead of that, I submit myself, I voluntarily enslave myself for the good of all of humanity to reach them. That's Paul's point. That's his priority. That's his mission. Second, and this is where this becomes very relevant to the church, our method is to find and create common ground in every redemptive relationship. I have become all things to all men so that I may by all means save some. Now this is a scary verse for people who don't like change. This is a very scary verse to the church. But it's an incredibly important subject on evangelism. It basically says we reach people on their terms, not ours. We reach people on their terms, not ours. The church may say, and you might say, you know what? Everyone's welcome here. We love everybody. And I got to tell you, this is, a, if for the, I'm talking about unity next, play, next week, so I'm not saying it always happens. We've had our disunity in the past. But in general, you are a warm and loving people. We've been really overwhelmed by that. Everybody is welcome here, we say. We love all people. The doors are open. And I got to tell you something. It's not enough. Not enough at all. It's, that's not obedience on this issue. At best, it's a warm sentiment. That's not opening doors to God's truth and love. It's just not locking people out. It's not opening doors. It's just not locking them out. Let me explain what Paul did and then talk about how it applies to us. Paul says, because he gives us four illustrations, he says, to the Jews, I became a Jew. Well, he was a Jew, so his point is, I sort of acted like one then. My message reflected that. A sermon to Jews would look like what? You know, okay, let's just pretend. You know, I'm 132nd Jewish, so, yeah, there you go. Anyway, so now I feel like I crucified Jesus, but anyway, other than that, I'm 132nd Jewish. Paul's saying, to the Jews, I became like a Jew. A sermon to the Jews would include what? Well, it would be rich in Old Testament traditions, wouldn't it be? Wouldn't you build on the stories that, that come out of the Old Testament? Because the Jews accepted the Old Testament as God's word. Paul spoke of Abraham in his sermons to Jews. He spoke of God's covenant with Israel. He talked about the law, the Ten Commandments. He talked about circumcision and what it did for Jews, making him part of the broader covenant people of God, and what it didn't do didn't save them but they thought it did they they believed that every jew was going to heaven based on the righteousness of abraham and gentiles were food for the fires of hell that's what the pharisees said they didn't care about gentiles they wanted to see god burn them all up they were excited about the prospect paul goes to the jews and he says no circumcision doesn't make you one of the people of god personally it might make you part of the nation of God, and they have a history with God, but it doesn't save you. He would have sermons on things that Jews related to. He had a common background as a Jew. He knew how to relate, so he found common ground, and he had a certain sermon. You know, Paul probably didn't get original every week, and neither did Jesus. I kind of resent that about Jesus. He probably had his top ten. You know, he's an itinerant evangelist. He's going around perfecting his messages, and he's God. You know, that's a tough act to follow. But Paul and Jesus would have their top ten, and he had one for the Jews, or maybe two or three for the Jews, that fit that audience. And then he says, to those under the law, I became as one under the law. Well, what does that mean? Doesn't that sound like a Jew under the law? Because Jews were under the law. Well, he's talking about a specific segment of Judaism. These are Paul's people, really. The Pharisees. 
That was a group of people Paul understood because he was a Pharisee before. So they were Jews also, <clears throat> but the sermon to a Pharisee would be different than the sermon to a regular Jewish person. Because Pharisees were true legalists. They thought they really were righteous. They didn't just care about the Ten Commandments, but I believe they looked at, I think this is an accurate number, I'm not just saying this to make a point, 632 Old Testament commandments that they felt they were under. And then a commentary on each one of those commandments that helped you flesh out how you could obey it. So they had the Bible, and then they had the extra Bible that explained this Bible. You know, like you have commentaries at home or, a, you know, a, a Bible background book or a, or a study Bible. There's all the extra stuff. The Jews had a lot of extra stuff to explain all of God's commands, and the Pharisees were committed to keeping all of those rules. And because of that, they naturally became self-righteous. I mean, when you're spending your day trying to figure out how to keep 632 commands and all of their applications, at the end of the day, you're feeling like, you know what? I'm a whole lot better than Joe, my neighbor, because he's not thinking about 632 commands. So you become self-righteous, which is a very tough place to be when you're lost because you don't see it. So Paul had a common background with them because he was a Pharisee. He knew how to relate to them. Do you remember some scriptures where he relates to people like that? How about Philippians 3, when he's talking about self-righteousness, he says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin, the most prominent of Jewish tribes of, you know, early in their history because Saul came from that tribe. I believe there's some other unique things about Benjamin. He says, I was a Pharisee. I kept all these rules. And then he says in Philippians 3, as to the law pertaining to the law, he's not talking about the Old Testament commands, he's talking about these extra rules, blameless. As to the law blameless what he's saying is i was better than the rest of you i kept all those rules he said but i consider all of that rubbish compared to the surpassing knowledge of knowing jesus christ as my lord and savior and finding righteousness as a gift from god not self-righteousness paul knew how to preach a sermon to pharisees it was very different than his sermon to regular jewish people he said to those without the law, that would be the rest of us. We're Gentiles. If you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. I'm a Gentile. We're without the law. We didn't have the Old Testament. We didn't have the promises of God. We didn't have the covenant. So Paul in the first century is talking to a group of people that don't respect that the Old Testament is even God's word. They don't care about the Old Testament. The Jews in the first century had no power. They were a, they were a conquered people. Nobody in Rome would pay attention to them or think that their religious system meant anything. Even if they did know the true God, nobody would believe it. So Paul said, I had to have a special sermon for that group of people because they don't relate to anything that Jews relate to. And the Old Testament is meaningless. So what's interesting is we find Paul preaching a sermon like that in Acts 17 in a city called Athens, Greece. A lot of philosophers there historically. The local philosophers, as he's in Athens, invite him to speak in what's called the Areopagus. It's a street that's sided on both sides with one false deity and one temple after another. And I imagine Paul is there walking up and down those streets and he's probably just torn on the inside about how lost people are and all the things they're willing to believe in made out of wood and stone. And it breaks his heart. And he's trying to think through, how can I speak to these people? And the local philosophers, including the Stoics and the Epicureans, you don't need to know who they are. But anyway, they invite Paul to speak. He's like, I've got a speaking engagement. What am I going to talk about? Do I pull out my Jewish sermon? Do I pull out my Pharisee sermon? No. He knows these people aren't going to get me. I need to get them. So here's what he did. He had noticed as he was walking down the Areopagus that they had a, an inscription and, and an idol or statue that was... Uh, that was called the unknown God. It was sort of like those pagans who were trying to figure out, you know, hey, we think we're serving all the right gods, but in case we missed one, <clears throat> you can make an offering to the unknown God. Cover all your bases. You know, it's kind of like going into battle with a tattoo of every major religion on your arm. You know, it's like, hey, I think I'm good, you know. I mean, the Bible doesn't teach that, but anyway. They've got, he, so he opens his sermon that way, you know, he says, I'm here and I noticed that you've got this altar to the unknown God. He said, I know him. 
I know that God. Let me tell you about him. And he talked about God's sovereignty as creator and ruler of all. He spoke about the futility of following a God made out of wood and stone. He actually quoted a secular poet and did not quote the Bible. Once. He told the story of God, the story of creation, but he didn't quote the Old Testament. He spoke about judgment. He spoke about the resurrection of Jesus and never mentioned Jesus or Christ by name. Think about that. He gave a message that included the resurrection and didn't name Jesus for some reason. I find that interesting. And people were converted to our faith by a sermon that didn't include the Bible, but included the Bible story. Because Paul is trying to figure out how I can relate to every person. He says, to the weak I became as weak. This probably refers to people who are just new in their faith, just turning the corner. They have no sense of freedom in Christ. So one of the examples we see elsewhere in Scripture is people used to go into idolatrous temples. And most meat sold in the marketplace was actually offered to idols first. And so Paul said to a weak person, you know, a weak person who used to worship in this temple probably isn't comfortable buying steaks in the marketplace that have been offered to the God of that temple. And Paul's view is the right view. He's like, a steak is a steak. The ribeyes are the best ones. And I don't care if they've been sacrificed to a God or not because I know the true God. I don't care if this steak was sacrificed to Diana. If it's a dollar cheaper at the market, that's the one I'm getting. That's what he says in the Greek. It's there. But he said, but he said, you know what? If I'm with a person who's weak, I recognize that I could shatter their faith by serving them that steak that has the stamp of Diana on it when it went through the butchers in the temple. So he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to withhold from that steak to protect their faith. In four different situations, Paul says, I'm going to act differently. I'm going to create a different environment. I'm going to reach people where they're at. The point is this, and this is the point you need to hear. The audience dictates the message. Paul never says to do ministry for the church people and let everyone else figure it out on our terms. I've got to tell you, they'll never figure it out. If the church is for you, only. You cannot expect the world to figure it out and to follow our God. Paul wanted church to be relatable and relevant to all. Starting with the priority of a non-believer. Now how does that flesh itself out? Because obviously most of us here know the Lord and probably have known the Lord for a long time. Many of you known the Lord before I existed. Church in the world. First, let's look at about five principles, and I will rush through these. The world hostile to God cannot be compromised with. We all know that. I'm not talking about compromise. The more you get to know me, the more you get to know, you know what, if I believe the Bible says something, I'm going to be, I'm going to dig in, and I'm not going to be flexible where God's word is involved, because we're not supposed to be flexible where God's word is involved. Our job is to understand authorial intent, what God meant when he said it, and to live it out accurately and faithfully. That's our job, not to try to change the Bible. That's going on everywhere. We don't have the erasable Bible. You're going to hear that about once a month. You'll get sick of it. We just don't have it. The world hostile to God cannot be compromised with. The, the true world that Jesus and the apostles speak of is always going to pressure the church to compromise. The ultimate weapon is, is persecution. Interestingly, persecution tends to make the church more pure and more committed to God's word, and less willing to compromise. But not in Western society. In Western society, we run to the world. We want to give them everything that they want so we can just get more people in the church, but by the time we're done, we don't believe anything. It's not the church. That's not salt and light. That's heresy. But that's what's going on in much of Western Protestantism. We compromise. Every time something new comes from the world, there's liberal theologians trying to figure out how somehow we can make that fit with our view of God. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you stand for truth, and it doesn't matter what happens. Better to have a smaller Christian group of people who believe the truth than everyone wondering what it is and not standing for anything. It always takes courage to believe the Bible. 
There are multiple things in the Bible I do not want to believe, starting with hell. But I didn't write it, and I'm not God. And my wife has reminded me I'm not God. So number one, the world hostile to God cannot be compromised with. Number two, the church was never intended to be for Christians only. Now this is where we're going to struggle. I get it. And, and some of you are, are really going to struggle with this. But I got to tell you, look at your Bible, 1 Corinthians. What was going on in 1 Corinthians? When people were speaking in tongues, which was this phenomena poured out in the early church that helped people understand the Spirit of God was moving to new people groups. What did Paul say? If you do that in church, you're going to have some problems because the people who are there who don't know Jesus think you're nuts. That's a little bit of a paraphrase, but it's in 1 Corinthians. The people who are there are going to think you're nuts because they don't know Jesus. They don't understand this is a spiritual phenomenon. Churches naturally become non-evangelistic over time. When church plants start, I mean, they're looking for all the disgruntled people from other churches and new converts, and they're all about reaching people with the gospel. But then the church grows a little bit, and programs are there for people who are already there. The budget is full of spending on us and maybe some worthy missions causes over there, but we stop relating to non-believers in our neighborhoods because that's the hardest thing to do. But if we don't plan on doing that and organize the church around that, it will never happen. In 1 Corinthians 2,000 years ago, the church was for believers and non-believers were present, which means it was for them too. Third, successful churches learn to think like outsiders, not insiders. James Emery White is an author from the States, a pretty, uh, really uh, significant church in the Carolinas that he leads. His daughter actually used to be on our staff in Rochester. Great guy. He says, you've seen this ad. A man goes into the store to buy some razor blades. They're locked up. He tries to get in, but it's like robbing Fort Knox. No one is around to help. So he tries harder, which sets off alarms that lead to him being assaulted by the staff. Remember these, these ads on TV about trying to get razors? You don't watch enough TV here. Okay. All right. Blow darts, punches to the stomach, and so on. Then the tagline, it's like they don't want you to buy razor blades. So then someone came along and offered a different way to buy razor blades. It struck a chord. According to the Wall Street Journal, web sales of razor blades through such companies as Dollar Shave Club have doubled in the last 12 months. Now, this was about 2015, but those sales were skyrocketing. They went from no slice of the market to nearly 10% just right away with little sign of slowing down. Through the first six months of 2015, they'd already doubled over all last year's totals, and this has just continued to rise, and companies like Gillette do not know what to do. How did a company like Dollar Shave Club, which didn't even exist in 2012, storm onto the scene and take, take such a big bite out of a company like Gillette that's been in existence since 1901? It's easy. Gillette and its distributors looked at things from the inside, from their perspective, not the consumer's. They made the experience of buying blades negative for shoppers. So when someone came along and listened to the consumer and then thought like a buyer, not a seller, they got a lot of buyers flocking to them. You can only imagine the Dollar Shave Club people thinking, okay, people hate the way razors are sold, but stores don't want them stolen. Let's just rethink a way how to get them into people's hands. Our job as the Church of Jesus Christ is to think of a way to get Jesus into people's hands. It's our number one job. And that is all about culture and the culture we create and the ministries we create and how we connect with people and what we emphasize. Next, outsiders must dictate the culture. Paul's a great example of this. We saw it in the text. Last summer, I was uh, between jobs. Could be between jobs again after this sermon. But anyway, last summer, I was between jobs and I went walleye fishing with my dad and my son. And uh, we had a great time. My dad said it was one of the best weeks of his life, which was really neat to hear. I had a, I had a pretty tough upbringing with him. It's been really neat to have that relationship solidified. And, and uh, we went to Ontario, um, the best part of Canada for fishing alone, but not the best part of Canada, for sure. But the best part of Canada for walleye fishing. And we went to a place called Timber Edge. It's over by Sioux Lookout friend of mine owned the lodge, gave me the great unemployed pastor discount. And we did really good for first-timers. 
Uh, we tried everything. We tried all kinds of structure, you know, rock structure, less structure, different depths, different sizes of jigs, you know, different lures. And we actually had some people who were regulars there. They go every year, and they were correcting us like we didn't know what we were doing, but we were probably outfishing most of the people there. And they were really shocked. You know, the camp owner's like, hey, you guys did really good for first-timers. Usually people can't figure this out this soon. And walleyes are tough to catch. You know, early in the spring, it's got to be a slow presentation, maybe a jig with a minnow in some places, maybe a lindy rig with a night crawler. But color matters. Water temperature matters. When it's too cold, the walleyes are sluggish. When it gets real warm, they get sluggish again. But in between, they're more active. And so, you know, what you, what you give them really matters. Uh, trolling can work, but when trolling works, the size of the plug matters, the color of the plug, the action of the plug, whether it's a Wally Diver or a Shad Wrap, all of it matters. That wasn't even funny. <laughs> I love you for laughing at me. Do you know what dictates what you use when you fish? Do you know what dictates it? The fish! Not us. It's the fish. I don't know what the percentage is. I'm just going to say this because right now you're in a believing mode. 90% <coughs> of the fish are caught by 10% of the fishermen. You know it's true. You've been on a lake next to somebody who just seems to be pulling them in right after left. Everyone else pulls their boat up closer. They're still not catching fish. Why is that? Because they know what the fish want. They understand their habitat. They know what's going to cause them to strike. The fish dictate it. Lost people dictate our culture. They should. Lost people need to dictate our strategies. And I know some of you are going to get real nervous now. But I got some good news for you. And this is really good news. Because some of you, especially you older people, are really worried about me. Because you hear me saying things like that. And you're thinking, oh my goodness, where is he taking us? We're going to be seeker sensitive. It's going to be a rock concert. We're going to have sermons on movie clips. And oh, we're going to lose Bethany. I got some good news for you. I got some bad news too. The bad news is you've kind of lost the Bethany of old already. I got some good news for you. Most churches that create cultures and strategies for lost people are actually more attractive to Christians as well. Because most things that are relevant to lost people are relevant to all people. And the question is, are we relevant? Not just to who, but are we relevant? So what do those churches do? What do we need to do? Well, I'm going to give you a few key themes. Not everything's broken here. There's some really wonderful things here. Not everything's broken here. But here are a few themes for the outsider. Number one, excellence in everything. So what do you mean by that, Paul? Excellence in everything. Excellence is the language of the culture. The reality is that people listen to Christian music all week. I don't, but most Christians do. I, I really don't like listening to Christian music. I like singing it, but I've never been a radio guy. Kind of like soft rock. Maybe that's a pagan thing. I don't know. But, but when people listen to Christian music, they're listening to the best artists in the world. And if people don't want to be here on a Sunday morning, they can turn on Andy Stanley. And I'm not Andy Stanley, but I've got to tell you something. I'm aware of him which means I don't feel like I can ever preach a C-minus sermon in my life and have people come back next week. So live with that pressure. That's my world. Excellence matters in speaking, in music, in our building. I was trying to figure out for the first month, what are the smells in this place? Where are they coming from? And we're starting to get to the bottom of it. But simple things that we all forgive. You know, you walked in that building, in that entrance, there's like, what's wrong? And Steve figured it out because I kept saying, what's wrong? And he found it. We had a drain that wasn't covered, that never had water go down it. It was stinking up the edge of our building. And Steve solved it. Good job. <laughs> you know, and there's some funky smell in here too. And I think it's the wood and the fact that the poly is no longer, you know, effective or something. But we don't even see those things anymore because why? You're in the family. Family doesn't, family doesn't notice the shag carpet that's orange and red from the 70s. Family doesn't notice that the cabinets are chipped. Family doesn't notice the dirt in the corners. But your visitors do. Speaking, music, our building, our programs, everything needs to be done excellently. And one of the things that Bethany has developed a culture of is we're a family. 
We can do anything on stage. We can do anything in our ministry. It doesn't matter. We all love each other. I got to tell you, that is a really wonderful perspective, except unbelievers don't relate to that. They just want excellence. I know that I'm going to say, I'm saying some things that are hard, but things need to be done better here in that standpoint. And if you have any complaints about what I'm saying, I want you to send them Aaron Mackey at BethanyChapel.com. Aaron Mackey, two A's at BethanyChapel.com. So excellence in everything. Excellence. All right? Don't we want people to come in here and, and leave saying, that was really good. That was really good. And as I did come in here to take this job for just a month and a half, <laughs> multiple people on the way in said they wouldn't invite somebody to Bethany because they didn't know what was going to happen when they got there. Those days are over. We're going to make progress. Six months from now, it's going to be different. A year from now, it's going to be different. We're going to get better. Where everything that's presented here is professional or semi-professional, not everyone can do everything. Not everyone can preach. I went to seminary with guys who school took their money, but they couldn't preach coming in or leaving. Somebody should have told them. That wasn't funny. I actually meant that. Somebody should have told them. Why, why do you laugh at things that aren't jokes? We need to get better. Relevance. The church needs to make sense. The church needs to be relevant to life's great questions. If a non-believing atheist is a minus 10 on the spiritual scale, and the perfect Christian, and there isn't one, is a plus 10, we need to make sense to the minus 5. Sort of the skeptical non-believer who was raised in a Christian home all the way up to the mature Christian. And we need to teach and relate to a person who's a pre-Christian and a mature Christian at the same time. And that's a challenge. But it's what we have to do because we want those people in the church. You need to be relevant. You talk about human problems, not just Christian problems, because we all have the same problems. We just haven't all figured out the solution yet. Relevance, excellence. We need to be biblical. Believe it or not, surveys still support that relevant teaching is the number one reason that people choose certain churches. In other words, for those of you who are worried that this guy from the States is going to come and water down everything, you need to know something. That Seeker-sensitive churches, I just don't even like that term because it sounds watered down, and so I, I hate the labels. But churches do not need to water down the message. They just need to be more understandable. Now, I've seen churches that do water down the message to get people in. I'm just telling you it's not necessary. But you need to be understandable and relatable, and that is still the number one, people, number one reason people choose churches. And we need to be family-friendly. Now, I'm going to say this again. I came in here, and when I came to Bethany, and, and there were little kids in the sanctuary and everything, and I'm thinking, why, is that because people don't want them in the kids' ministry? No, we don't do children's ministry in the summer. Or we don't have enough volunteers, so sometimes we have it, sometimes we don't. I almost had a heart attack. I've never heard of such a thing. And I've talked to families with children, and they're like, oh yeah, in the summer, one of us has to stay home with the kids, one of us can come, and, and somehow somebody said that was okay here i got to tell you something, that's not okay. I've never heard of it. So in a few weeks when I do my serving sermon, guys, we need to have a flood of people walking into April's office saying, I'm on the schedule, use me as you want. And, and you can't tell me, oh, Paul, we all take the summer off. If we take the summer off, we should be canceling church, and I shouldn't have to preach either. But the reality is in the summer, 80% to 85% of you are here anyway. The sanctuary changes, you know, maybe 15%. But most of you are here most weeks. Or you go from three weeks a month to two weeks a month. We can't have a church that doesn't have children's ministries in the summer, especially when we want to attract young families. They are golden here. We can't lose any of them, and we need to attract them. Are you with me on that? All right, so then in a few weeks when we talk about serving, will you be with me on that? All right, thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take pictures, and everyone who said amen. And finally... And I've really blown it here on time, and I'm I am sorry. Because that's one of the things I've talked to the elders about. I'm talking to them about we need to have a consistent service that starts and ends, and I'm really messing it up. Cultural relevance and adaptability is a big deal. This is a big deal. 
this is the deal. I know some of you want to believe, and I, I, I'm, I'm not against this, so please do not misquote me. I've said plenty that will get me in trouble already. If we just pray more, that will bring them in. If we just have this program, that will bring them in. If we just do something with the university kids, that will bring them in. i got to tell you, the solution is becoming relevant so that they actually want to be here. It's not figuring out another program so we can kind of drag people. It's becoming a place people actually want to be. This is a big deal. It's the big deal. In Acts 15, you have the greatest church fight in the history of the planet. Acts 15, you should read it later. The early Jewish Christians are fighting with the rest of the church about whether or not people need to become Jews in order to become Christians. So the early Jewish Christians were circumcised. They're Israelites. They're of the people of God. Circumcision was a mark in their flesh of the men that they were a part of the broader national people of God because God had this national covenant with Israel in the Old Testament. So as they became Christians and Gentiles are coming to church, they're like, you know what? You need to become Jewish, not just follow Jesus. So the Jewish Christians wanted the Gentile Christians to get circumcised. That'll put a stop to church growth. Now that is funny. All right, so I'll give you pointers when it's funny. That's funny. The church fight was over whether adult men had to be circumcised. I mean, can you imagine? Can you, what a business meeting to be in. Wow. I would pay anything to go back in time and be in that one. Just to write jokes. Anyway. They get through this and they decide we are not going to do this to Gentile men. For crying out loud, this is insanity. One chapter and one verse later, after this decision has been made, Paul is going on a missions trip with a young man named Timothy. Timothy is raised in a home, kind of a mixed religious home. He's not Jewish. You know what Paul says to Timothy? Hey, dude. It's, it's in the Greek. Hey, dude. We are going to an area full of Jews. And I got to tell you, I love you, son, like a son. I love you. And you need to take one for the team. You need to do a little doctor visit. There's anesthetics. and I mean, it'll be all right, you know. Take a lot of herbal tea or something. Paul tells Timothy right after the greatest church fight in the history of the planet to get circumcised to go on a short-term missions trip. I'll never go on a short-term missions trip again if that's the cost. Paul made Timothy do it. Now later on, Jews want another young minister to get circumcised. His name is Titus. Do you know what Paul said? Not on your life and not on my life. You are not going to force him to be circumcised. This is ridiculous because of what we decided in Acts 15. Well, how can you have him? I mean, Timothy's thinking, what's the deal here? Why is he special? I mean, that's ridiculous. Paul said, see, in Galatians, when it was Titus, it was the Judaizers, the false teachers, trying to make Titus get circumcised, so Paul resisted because it was false teaching. In the other situation, it was missions. we got to reach people on their level. One audience needed to be confronted. One needed to be accommodated. Well, I've done everything I can do to offend as many as possible. But this is the most important message for the future of this church. And this is what we're working to create so that someday Bethany can have its best future. So that you won't be looking back in the 90s thinking, remember back when we were, but rather we can have a future where we are a light in this part of Calgary to every generation to change the world for Jesus. We all want that. There's a prescription for it, and it will require change. But when it happens, even though the music will get louder, again, Aaron Mackey at BethanyChapel.com. The music will get louder. Not everyone will be able to get up and do everything we've done in the past on stage. It's going to be a little bit, some of you will be like, oh, it's gotten so professional. I just don't like that. I get it. I get it. But what we've been doing doesn't work. Where we need to go does. And God blesses that. This is a spiritual principle. God, we thank you for your word. 
and I pray that we would be able to obey this that we would be able to become the kind of church that people want to be at, not just because we've known people here for 10 or 20 or 30 years, but because there's something going on here and lives are being changed and things make sense and God makes sense for the first time and, and people are friendly and there's good coffee. It's a cool place to be. I pray that you would help us to get where we need to be because we are placing ourselves under the needs of the world around us. We are enslaving ourselves to the lost because they matter most. In Jesus' name, amen.